Mr. Dean, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to be invited to give a talk uh, to a distinguished law faculty is a privilege. It's a privilege, and I'm grateful to the organizers, and in particular to Mr. Dean. Uh, when I uh, was approached with the invitation, I was granted a second uh, privilege, which was full freedom to choose my title and my subject matter. So um, a very wide uh, margin of appreciation, if you like. And I choose this uh, to speak about uh, dynamism in uh, the uh, case law of the uh, European Court of Human Rights. So I am all the more grateful for this uh, invitation. With this lecture, I will take the opportunity to share with you my thoughts on a subject that is truly a fundamental aspect in uh, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the dynamism I shall discuss and I shall defend is a defining feature of uh, European rights law. That is to say, the law of the European Convention on Human Rights. It is a vital force at work within the Convention. It is a part of the legal reality that is rooted in the Convention. And it has implications for the entire Convention community. The 47 contracting parties that together make up the what is called the Grand Espace Juridique Européen. Croatia entered uh, into that uh, community exactly 20 years uh, ago, in November 1997. And that is the occasion for my visit to your country. I'm happy to have the opportunity to take part in some of the events taking place to celebrate that anniversary. The European Convention on uh, Human Rights is the most developed and the most successful of the international human rights systems that have been created in the modern era. Why is this? There are several good explanations. I will begin with the political explanation. There is a strong political commitment to the Convention and to the Convention system in Europe. Of this, I am convinced based on my contacts and conversations with political leaders from many states. A week ago, our court received a visit from President Macron of France. In the presence of the plenary court, of the whole diplomatic community of Strasbourg, and of the senior figures of the French justice system, he stated in the clearest terms his country's support for the convention, its historic support its present support, and its support going forwards into the future. His eloquent, impassioned words could be adopted by many other European states and leaders who take a similar stance on the vital importance of respect for human rights as an integral part of the idea of Europe. That is not to say that there are no critical or contrary voices no disagreement or dissent. It is not rare to hear skeptical, negative, and even hostile political commentary coming from certain parts of the political spectrum or from certain parts of the wider Europe. Strasbourg, like the European project itself, has its detractors. There are times when these voices seem to enjoy more attention and to gain more airplay than other side of the conversation. But the very existence of the convention and its history from the drafting, the ratifications, and the many reforms up to the present day derives from steadfast political will. It shows the long-lasting commitment of European states to what is their convention. For it is, as you know, a collective system. And that collective nature is certainly a strength while the public eye, and certainly the legal, legal eye, may be drawn more to the court, it is not an institution standing alone. Standing by its side, it's the other convention institution, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. Its function on the Article 46 of the convention is the essential complement to the judicial function. It is only when the court's judgments are fully executed that the convention system achieves what it was created to do, to protect human rights and fundamental freedoms. It is well known 
that there are certain problematic situations in Europe as regards the execution of judgments. Though one should not forget that the overwhelming majority of cases are implemented loyally and in good faith by states. I should make mention of the recent announcement of the Committee of Ministers of its intention to make use for the first time of its power under Article 46, Paragraph 4 of the Convention in response to the continuing failure of one state to execute a judgment with very serious personal consequences for the applicant in question. I use this to illustrate my point about the political commitment that has always been needed for the convention system to work, to function, and not merely to exist. And it is worth adding that the importance of the convention for Europe is fully recognized by the institutions of the European Union too. Respect for human rights truly represents an essential part of the European identity and of its culture. And of course, there is also a legal explanation for the measure of success that the Convention has achieved. I have in mind the deep permeation of European human rights norms into the domestic legal order of all of our states. To be clear, the Convention order is to be distinguished from the EU legal order, of course, which is supranational and rests on the supremacy and unity of EU law. The Convention stands in a different relationship to the domestic system. Being an international treaty, i.e. an instrument of public international law, yet by virtue of its substance, it closely coincides with constitutional norms and principles. Constitutional jurisprudence across Europe has been largely very receptive indeed to the principles developed in the Convention case law. As a matter of course, supreme and constitutional courts refer to the Strasbourg case law in the course of their reasoning, generally treating it as authoritative, as Article 32 of the Convention ordains. In this way, the Convention and its jurisprudence can be said to suffuse the constitutional orders of the states of Europe. Furthermore, and still relevant to the legal explanation, the rights of the Convention rights are now, de jure, part of the domestic law of all of the contracting states. It was not always so. For states adhering to the dualist model, it, it required some positive act of incorporation or transposition. A well-known example, and a very successful one, I would say, is the Human Rights Act of 1998 in the United Kingdom. Other countries reached the same position via constitutional provision, <coughs> legislative choice, or judicial interpretation. And so today, convention rights are directly enforceable in the domestic courts in accordance with the relevant forms and procedures of each legal system. This is the necessary condition for the concept of subsidiarity to produce its effects within the convention system. It provides to the individual, who is, uh, after all, the essential subject and primary concern of the convention, the means to vindicate his or her rights at the national level first. It makes the national courts the juge naturel of the Convention, and it allows the European Court to play its intended subsidiary role in safeguarding human rights. Now, I want to put a third explanation before you, and here I come to dynamism. As I said at the outset, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights is characterized by its dynamism. This is generally traced back to the judgment given in 1978 in the case of Tyler versus the United Kingdom, as this was the first occasion that the court referred to the convention as a, I quote, living instrument. That particular period, the latter part of the 70s, was a key stage in the life of the convention, by the way. The court delivered a serious 
of judgments that stand to this day as guiding precedents on the interpretation and application of the Convention, and notably Tyra. To quote more fully from the judgment, the court said it. It must recall that the Convention is a living instrument which must be interpreted in the light of the present day conditions. In the case now before it, uh, the case was about, uh, as you, m many of you know, uh, corporal punishment in the Isle of Man. The court cannot be influenced by the develop, cannot be, cannot but be influenced by the developments and commonly accepted standards in the penal policy of member states of the Council of Europe in this field. It was no incidental remark, but instead the articulation of an approach, an avowedly dynamic approach, which entered there and then into European human rights law. Tyra was about uh, Article 3. You know, the Article 3 prohibits torture and other inhuman, cruel, inhuman and, uh, treatment or pun uh, punishment. But the court was speaking of the convention in general terms, taking in its entire substance and as later cases have established, the procedural provisions too. The Convention was adopted, as its preamble says, with a view in particular to the further realization of human rights and fundamental freedoms. It is clear, therefore, at least it is clear for the Court, that the substantive content of the rights and freedoms enumerated by the Convention must evolve in line with progress in the legal, social, economic, and scientific fields. An evolutive interpretation of the Convention permits to its norms to be adapted to the complex development of European societies, a continuous process which permanently creates new situations and thus new challenges. In this connection, consensus, i.e. clear trends in the practice towards a certain direction, plays an important role. As my predecessor, Dean Spielmann, put it, the quest for establishing a consensus concerns both the evolution of domestic law and the practice of contracting states, but extends also to international instruments. Indeed, in defining the meaning of terms and notions in the text of the Convention, the Court can and must take into account elements of international law other than the Convention and the interpretation of such elements by competent organs. The consensus emerging from uh, specialized international instruments may constitute a relevant consideration for the Court when it interprets the provisions of the Convention in specific cases. Naturally, the court's dynamic approach has been the subject of a great deal of legal commentary. A factor so fundamental cannot be marginalized or passed over in any work of scholarship on the Convention. To pick just one uh, author, Professor William Shabas, in his very comprehensive commentary on the Convention, remarks that, in one sense, Dynamic and evolutive interpretation is not interpretation at all, but lawmaking. Well, that is not the sense that I can bring myself to agree with. But the, other, the author continues by pointing out the parallel between the court's approach on the one hand and classic constitutional reasoning on the other. That point is well made indeed, for there is a real similarity of interpretative method. The proposition that the nation's constitution is a living document to be construed in light of the natural and inevitable evolutions in society is widely accepted as part of legal orthodoxy. But the convention, for all its substantive similarity to a national constitution or bill of rights, and although it is a constitutional instrument of European public order, as the court uh, puts it, is of another legal species. It is a treaty, an instrument of public international law, a text whose authority rests on state's acceptance. One of the great legal figures of our time, Lord Bingham, took this point up in an observation he made in a case before the House of Lords. 
Referring to the European Court's practice of uh, implying terms into the Convention, in other words, evolutive interpretation, he stated, the process of implication is one to be carried out with caution. If the risk is to be averted that the contracting parties may, by judicial interpretation, become bound by obligations which they did not expressly accept and might not have been willing to accept. Having sounded that cautionary note, let me now turn to the case law as I further develop my team. There is, of course, a great abundance of decided cases that exemplify the court's dynamism. Certain cases are very well known, like Dudgeon versus the United Kingdom on homosexual relations, Christine Goodwin versus the United Kingdom on transsexualism, or more recently, Bayatian versus Armenia on conscience objection to military service. A comprehensive uh, treatment of the subject cannot be fitted one into one uh, lecture, of course. So I have chosen one case to serve as my, as my, so to speak, textbook example. I will proceed from here essentially in relation to the reasoning of that judgment, which I consider to be the fullest and firmest expression of dynamic interpretation. The case in question The case in question uh, is a recent ruling delivered a year ago by the Grand Chamber of the Court. It is Magyar Helsinki Bizotag versus Hungary. And if you don't mind, I will refer to the applicant by the English translation of the name, which is easier for me. It's, uh, so Hungarian Helsinki uh, Committee, because uh, Hungarian names are quite uh, difficult for, for, for me. I have to pronounce in public, I risk to offend the uh, beautiful Hungarian language. Uh, the question of law in arising in that case was whether Article 10 of the Convention, the right uh, to freedom of expression, may be held to include a right of access to information held by public authority, with a corresponding obligation on the authorities to impart that information. To set the scene, I will uh, very briefly summarize the factual background to the case uh, as follows. The Hungarian Helsinki uh, Committee, which is of course a, a reputable human rights uh, NGO, had taken an interest in the quality of legal services provided under Hungary's public defender system. From its initial research into the subject, it identified certain problems. Whenever a suspect was granted legal advice paid for by the state, it was the police who chose the lawyer. Issues of trust between client and lawyer could arise out of that. It also pointed to a tendency on the part of the police to appoint the same lawyers again and again instead of working through the list of counsel drawn up by local bar associations. It wanted to take its research further, and so it contacted police departments throughout the whole country for looking for more information. Specifically, it asked to receive the names of all the lawyers who, in the year 2008, had been appointed to act as public defenders. In most cases, their request was granted, but not in all. Two, in particular, two police departments refused. And their refused was based on Hungary's data protection law. Under the Data Act, the names of lawyers were to be treated as private data. This position was endorsed by the Supreme Court which ruled that that police could, uh, police could not be compelled to communicate the uh, information. At this point, it may be noted that the domestic proceedings had a rather narrow focus, just referring to data protection as regulated in national law, and making no reference to the public interest value of the information in question, 
and no reference to any freedom of expression dimension to the case. Before I come to the European level, it is relevant to mention that in another contracting state, a domestic court was also considering a freedom of information request, and in its reasoning, the judges analyzed carefully the existing Article 10 case law. This was the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, and the case was called Kennedy versus the Charity Commission. While it was ultimately decided on a different legal basis, there were signals sent in the direction of Strasbourg about the relevant case law. The signal coming from the majority was a critical one. One judge considered that the case law was in an unsatisfactory state. Another judge saw the need for, and I quote, a clear, high-level exegesis of the salient principle and its essential components. From the minority, the signal was more positive. One of those judges considered the most recent European case law on the question of access to information not to be in contradiction with the earlier authorities, but to be a dynamic extension of them. We all know what judicial dialogue means in uh, the context of the convention. It is the interaction that takes place between the domestic and the European levels, and it is a vital ingredient in the implementation of the convention. And by the way, I could take advantage of this visit to Zagreb because I had the opportunity to meet with my colleagues, uh, both the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court. This, is, this dialogue is of essence for the future of the European system of uh, human rights. Uh, usually, it is conceived as a vertical dialogue. What I've just described could be called a diagonal dialogue with the judicial message coming in at a different angle. I think it is an interesting feature of the case that the British government was granted leave to intervene as a third party. In this way, the various comments of the UK Supreme Court could be brought to the notice of the European Court. And by the way, the case of Mr. Kennedy, who did not obtain satisfaction between, before the Supreme Court, was later brought to Strasbourg and is now pending before our court. Coming back to the Hungarian Helsinki Committee case, the Grand Chamber began its analysis with the simple fact that, unlike other international human rights texts and treaties, Article 10 of the Convention does not refer to any right or freedom to seek information. The Convention text speaks of freedom to receive and impart information and ideas without interference by public authority. Contrast this with Article 19 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Both of these state that freedom of expression, and I quote, shall include freedom to seek receive and impart information and ideas, end of quote. The classical case law position on this point was laid down in the Leander case in 1987. That applicant was seeking disclosure of information about him that was held by the authorities and which was relied on to deny him access to employment that required a security clearance. He advanced, so an argument, on the Article 10 of the Convention. And to this, the court replied that Article 10 basically prohibits a government from restricting a person from receiving information that others wish or may be willing to impart to him, and that it did not, in circumstances as such as those of the present case, confer on the individual a right of access to a register containing information on his personal position, nor does it embody an obligation on the government to impart such information to the individual. So this was the classical case law. 
And this position was confirmed in later cases, including several decided by the Grand Chamber. I can mention some of them. Gaskin versus the United Kingdom, Guerra and others versus Italy, Roche versus the United Kingdom, and so on and so forth. I would point out, though, that what these cases had in common was that they were not mainly about Article 10. Instead, the applicants were relying principally on Article 8, seeking to establish a right to receive from the authorities information connected in some way to their private lives. But in other cases, more recently decided at the chamber level, the point about access to information was taken and was recognized under Article 10, leading the court to find that there had been a violation of that article. At this point, uh, let me add a word of uh, explanation of the internal judicial hierarchy of the European Court. Maybe not all of you are familiar with, with that structure. Its supreme judicial organ is the Grand Chamber, which is empowered to maintain consistency in the case law. Where a chamber is dealing with a case that has the potential to create a conflict of case law, the rules of the court provide that it must send the case to the Grand Chamber. If different lines of case law have emerged in any area of the Convention, and this will happen on occasion, the Grand Chamber can resolve the difference in a later case. But in the present case, the Grand Chamber did not, in fact, find a conflict or a contradiction in the case law. After all, the statement in the classical case law, the case Leander I mentioned before, was qualified by a reference to the circumstances of that case. Now, what may be ruled out in one set of circumstances is not necessarily ruled out in other circumstances. <coughs> Having addressed that point, the judgment then embarks on an interpretative exercise that is a paradigm of the Strasbourg method. And it commences with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, the authoritative standard in public international law. Referring to the Vienna Convention is deeply ingrained in the court's practice, first done in the famous Golda case of 1975, and on many occasions since. The court has engaged in interpretation in the light of the rules contained in Articles 31 to 33 of the Vienna Convention. <coughs> These rules of interpretation refer first to the ordinary meeting, the meaning of the wording, taken in the context and in light of the object and purpose of the treaty. In article, I refer in particular to Article 31, <coughs> Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention. And as to the context, the court has repeatedly emphasized that the Convention is a treaty for the effective protection of individual human rights. That its object and purpose, too. As the long settled case law of the court states, this commands an interpretation that makes human rights practical and effective, not theoretical and illusory. Here we touch on the golden thread that runs through the Strasbourg case law, the concern for effectiveness. It constantly informs the court's analysis and its action. And I refer here to the Grand Chamber judgment that established the binding nature of the court's interim measures, the famous Mad Matukolov and Askarov case, which refers in the same sentence to Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention and to the principle of effectiveness. The court also underlines the difference between the convention and the more classic type of treaty that sets out the reciprocal commitments of the parties. However, the fact remains that convention is a part of international law, and such it should be interpreted as far as possible in harmony with other international legal rules. It is not to be construed in a vacuum, nor it is to be construed in isolation from relevant legal developments in the contracting states. 
the common international or domestic law standards accepted by them is a reality that cannot be disregarded by the court. And I pause here to observe that it is this point, above all, that supports a dynamic judicial stance towards the Convention. For this fundamental text must not be permitted to lose its relevance or significance with the passage of time. Thank you. By its nature, a human rights treaty, like a Bill of Rights, is intended to endure, to retain its effectiveness on an ongoing basis. It is not its destiny to be marginalized by later standard setting, nor should it, as has been said in other cases, end up as a bar or obstacle to reform or improvement within or among the contracting states. In this theory of interpretation, the significance of the drafting history, the travaux préparatoires, is more relative than determinative. Just as, according to the Vienna Convention, the preparatory work on a treaty may be used as a supplementary, only supplementary, means of interpretation. In its practice, the court has often referred to the drafting history of one or another convention provision. The Hungarian Helsinki Committee case is one of them, although with that you might call an unusual twist. It was argued by the intervening government, but this confirmed the relative value of uh, travaux préparatoires, the disappearance of a reference to a right to seek information, which appeared in the first draft, but vanished subsequently, was a deliberate omission that militated against bringing that point back into the text of Article 10 by interpretation. But, the drafting history of uh, the provision is somewhat laconic. The historical record contains little indication of the thinking and the discussion from which Article 10 finally emerged. The court drew two conclusions from this, that the travaux préparatoires were not conclusive either way, and that an interpretation in the sense favored by the, the applicant could not be ruled out. The twist I mentioned a moment ago was another drafting history of what was intended to become the sixth protocol to the Convention. To avoid uh, any confusion, let me clarify that the uh, actual, the, the current sixth protocol of 1983 concerns the abolition of death penalty in peacetime. What was initially intended to be the sixth protocol eventually became the seventh protocol adopted in 1984. The relevant point is that the original draft prepared by the Steering Committee for Human Rights included a provision that would add to Article 10 of the Convention and express freedom to seek information. That, which was the point of course at stake, that proposal was withdrawn in light of comments made by the European Commission of Human Rights and by the court that this freedom should be regarded as already implicit in Article 10. For the Grand Chamber, this was a noteworthy indication of a common understanding between the bodies and institutions of the Council of Europe about the meaning of the existing Article 10. As for the consensus emerging from relevant international instruments and from the laws of the contracting states, it suffices to say that the judgment found both a broad consensus, the comparative level, and the high degree of consensus, the international and EU level. It is interesting to note that in this passage of its reasoning, the judgment also has regard to the position in other regional human rights systems, the inter-American and the African. In both systems, a link between the right to seek information and freedom of expression had been recognized. Faced with an evolving convergence as to the standard of human rights protection to be achieved, the Grand Chamber proceeded to clarify, not to contradict, the classic Leander principles. Clarify is indeed the word, because in most respects, the existing principles were affirmed. Thus, no general duty on the state to collect and disseminate information of its own motion 
and no general right of access for an individual to information held by the state. But in certain circumstances, such a right for the individual or such a duty for the state may arise. That is as far as I need to go with the reasoning of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee case for my present purpose. After all, this is not a lecture about freedom of expression or freedom of information. But I should at least add that the court did uphold the complaint of a violation of Article 10 in that case. The judgment was accompanied by three separate opinions, two concurring and one dissenting. In the second opinion that I would like to refer to, written by Judge Sicilianos, I will limit myself to its key points. First question, are the living instrument approach and the approach based on the drafting history antithetical? No, argues the opinion, even if it may so appear. That is because of the presumed intention of the state parties. Based on their choice of relatively open textured language in the wording of the convention and on the fact that it is a treaty not limited in time, it can be considered that states anticipated an interpretation reflecting contemporary developments. Instead of periodic updating by formal amendment, e.g. the European Social Charter and the Revised Social Charter, the Convention is continuously adapted to present-day conditions. In this way, it is, its permanence is ensured. Next question, what are the limits of the dynamic approach? There are several. There is a textual limit. A legal text must not be interpreted to the point of distortion. Thus, as held in different case, in a different case, the right to life cannot be considered to encompass a right to die. Interpretation cannot be contra legem. Next, an interpretation must conform to the object and purpose of the text in question, or else that would betray the drafter's intention and undermine the treaty. The third limit derives from the very first articulation of the living instrument approach, that it takes account of conditions of the present day, not those that may materialize in the future. As this was put in a joint opinion appended to an earlier judgment, evolutive interpretation is to accompany an even channel change, but not to anticipate and still less to impose it. So the opinion then addresses the importance and probative, uh, probative value of the travaux préparatoire, an issue that I have already touched on. And so I will leave this part of the text for the reader to appreciate it in full. This leads to the final part of the opinion, which defends the view that the court's interpretation of Article 10 in this case is consistent with the use of the tools in Article 31 of the Vienna Convention. Not without a certain audacity, the opinion reconciles the reasoning of the judgment to the relevant provisions of Article 31, paragraph 3. It sees in the episode of the draft sixth protocol, a subsequent agreement between the parties regarding the interpretation of the treaty. And in the widespread enactment of national laws on freedom of information, it sees a subsequent practice in the application of the convention to be taken into account for the purpose of interpretation. Finally, it suggests that Article 19, paragraph 2, of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, binding on all the Convention States, should be taken as a relevant rule of international law, applicable in the relations between the parties. For me, the argumentation of Judge Sicilianos is persuasive. In fact, I adhere to that, that opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, I have now covered the ground I intended to cover in my talk. Of course, I have not exhausted the subject, far from it. The process of evolutive judicial interpretation of a human rights treaty is a complex one. That is well illustrated by the judgment I have presented to you and by many other cases in the Strasbourg canon. The process is never free of controversy. Again, in the Hungarian Helsinki Committee judgment shows this. While 
I am convinced by its reasoning. The Grand Chamber was not unanimous, and my colleague, Judge Spano, set out his dissenting view in a lengthy and closely argued separate opinion. I myself have been in that situation in other occasions, but crucially, our disagreements respect the premise of dynamic interpretation. It is within that accepted framework that judicial views diverge. And just as the judges themselves may reason they weigh rigorously to opposing, opposing conclusions, so in the other constituencies, so to speak, of the court, the states, the domestic judiciary, legal scholarship, other human rights, rights courts and bodies, civil society, society, and not forgetting uh, applicants themselves, it is not at all rare that a Strasbourg judgment divides informed opinion. But I defend the dynamism of the European Court of Human Rights. It is a stance that sits well with the ultimate purpose of human rights, a high and noble branch of law that proceeds from the essence of our humanity, protecting the dignity, integrity, and freedom of the human being. It is an international court's version of a judicial policy that reigns in contemporary constitutional adjudication. It is by now an established attribute of the Strasbourg Court, and one can only expect it to so remain. One should also expect, however, from the court that it will apply its characteristic method with discernment and with rigor, in short, with good judgment, so that it keeps faith with the authors of the convention who gave to the court the final word in interpretation of the convention. And it keeps trust with Europeans who should be able to see at Strasbourg the vigilant custodian of our continent's treasured Bill of Rights. I thank you very much for your attention.